takes the pillow, sticks it over her face, and snuffs out her last breath of life. Sue Jory and Connie Navarro were brutally murdered in Navarro's Westwood condominium. They say for every homicide, 10,000 people are affected. He changed an entire family forever. What does it bring up? What is your trepidation? It feels ugly to tell the story. I've never been one to not share what's going on with me emotionally. I think as an artist and as a musician, that's just inherent. That's what we do. Everybody started screaming. It's massive scene. Is this the murder weapon? Dude, that was fucking heavy. It's the most profound moment of my life, and I don't think that I should sweep it under the rug anymore. It, I mean, it just was the darkest, most horrible moment of my life. I mean, there's a new dark side of Dave, of course, that emerged that moment for the next time we saw you. When he started getting into heroin, it frightened me. He just had these snake trails all up and down, and it was just looking awful. We were touring all over the world, and we were getting famous and well-known. The whole time I'm out touring the world, Riccardi was still on the loose. There was fear and terror. I mean, terror. He's out there. He's arrogant. He's vain. He's working the system. Nobody can catch him. I was afraid. Is he going to kill me? When you really got involved. You really wanted this man to face justice. Organized, organized offender. All these things start falling into place. I could hurt you right here, and nobody would do anything. Leave me alone. There are no locks that can keep me out of your house. The ultimate form of vengeance and punishment is inflicted on March the 3rd, 1983. I had lost my mother, and I almost lost everything before that. On that day, everything, everything changed. Guys, thanks for being here. Congratulations on this movie. Thank you. On this project. It was a, a sort of a long project that I'm sure you had been thinking about for a really long time making. When did you finally find that you had the courage, the bravery to set about making this? First of all, I just want to say good to see you again. Good to see you, and Dave. happy to see you guys. Thanks for coming out. <laughs> Especially you way in the back there. Really happy to see you. Um, it wasn't really about finding the courage, it was about finding the time. I mean, because this was a story that happened many, many years ago, and uh, we wanted to make a film. So we were talking one night, and we were like, well, what should we make a movie about? What should we talk about? And I was like, you know what? I got the story. And we talked about my mother's murder. And I said, this would be a great story. And then we talked about it and realized that documentary style would be a great way to present it as opposed to scripted or acted. And uh, it just evolved from there. So it wasn't really a, a question of courage, although in hindsight it looks that way to me and I understand the question, but uh, it was really more about getting out and doing it. We just wanted to become filmmakers and we figured the best way to do that is to stick to a story that I know inside and out. And uh, it evolved from there. So you, you start from an almost uh, a structural or aesthetic perspective, right? I want to make a documentary. This is a story that I'm close to. But did you find while making it that it ended up sort of opening up wounds that, that, that you weren't looking to open up again? I mean, there's the moment where, you know, near the end of the film, not to give anything away, where you guys are driving away from the prison. And, and one of the things that I think you say, Todd, is that there are groups for victims that are created, whereas we just sort of dove into this blind. Yeah, I mean, we, we sort of dove into the entire process blind, kind of not knowing what we're doing and trying things out. And I think that one of the uh, things to even jump back to correlate it to your first question is, is the, the courage and stuff came in the making of it, to just continuing to see how to explore this story and get it on film and how to aesthetically tell the story that, you know, the way that we wanted to. Um, a kind of like, can't stop now. 
Yeah, well, not necessarily just a can't stop now, but uh, because we had complete control of the film, we weren't working with a studio, we financed the thing ourselves, it was just he and I, we had the power to, well, we can't stop now, but if we can if we want to, or if it's necessary to, or if it's necessary to take breaks. There was no time limit. Yeah, and also, I'll be honest with you, it was just Todd and I made the film. The courage wasn't making the film. The courage was releasing it. <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? Because that's the answer. The courage was we were as protected as we could be. I mean, we, it was just two guys making a film literally in the back house. Um, and it, was, it wasn't until we were deep in the process of making the film that we realized, hey, this could speak to other victims of domestic violence, of other people who've gone through trauma and loss and tragedy in their own lives, and this could be a helpful tool so people don't feel alone. And uh, it was that component that that made this thing kind of take on a life of its own and and really be important for us. You dive into some some really dark footage of yourself when you were still, uh, still struggling uh, with addiction at the time, and uh, I'm wondering if that's stuff that hurt to dive back into or if you've sort of dealt with since you since uh you the drug addiction stuff did not hurt to dive back into in fact it looked awesome to me (laughs) (laughs) i mean there's something to be said for the fact that you know obviously addiction is is a terrible terrible part of my story and and luckily i've i've gone i've moved past it but um you know i think for me i mean all those times weren't awful you know um so it was it was my inability to to be responsible to my own life and to my friends and my family uh, that was the, the painful part. But having distance from it and just looking at the footage and the memory of it, like film, I mean, it's film, it's past tense. Um, it was enlightening and... Uh, has your, has your sort of, has your sobriety kind of shielded you from having a, any sort of painful experience with that footage at all? Um, I guess so. I mean, I, I don't really. Know. You're a completely different person now, I anyway. Why yeah, that that's would be that footage is is not something that happened a year ago. Yeah, you know, yeah. that was like 20 years ago. So it's, it's like, true. Yeah, it's like... not really. It's not rattling around in my head right now. But I, it it was uh, it was a necessary part of the storytelling. You know what I mean? Like uh, because part of my story in the film is moving through trauma, and really showing the different avenues that I tried that weren't healthy, that were ultimately more deteriorating on the journey. And you're still, I mean, in in, in many ways, uh, addiction is a form of self-destruction. There's a kind of artistic self-destruction to your life your life now i guess destruction might be the wrong word because that would imply that there's something bad happening but we see you sort of cutting your head i know you do different kinds of uh body art and 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 piercings which many could be considered an artistic form of self-destruction do you think that's born out of the trauma as well no i think that those are all elements of my life that i'd be interested in regardless of what my history was um much like i think that i would have been a drug addict regardless of the crime i mean Oh, yeah. I mean, think about how many victims of violent crime there are out there in the world that aren't drug addicts. You know what I mean? They just learn to live. And uh, for me, I was well on my way to being a drug addict before this ever happened. Um, So, no, I don't think those things go hand in hand. And what we were trying to show in the film and the bloodletting and and the painting at the end, ultimately, is that it was an artistic, metaphoric way of showing beauty can come from trauma and pain. Uh, Todd, you've been friends with Dave for for a while now. That's pretty much how you started this project with him. Did you guys ever butt heads at all while you were making the film? Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, there was, um, it was always, uh, the headbutting that went on was more about, uh, do we, is this the best way to show this? Is this, you know, there were certain elements that I felt as the director, we need to, establish this or we need to put this in here and there were things that he was staunchly no about and there were things that he would say show me why and I would show me why we need to put this in here and I would explain it to him and he'd be like you're right so 
it was butting heads, but it was creative. It was never, you know, like arguing in that sense of getting emotional in that sense between us. Never like losing sense of the project or just too frustrated with each other. It's just sort of collaborating. No, I mean, with a project like this, with how emotional it is and the story itself, it's uh, there was a lot of me riding the line of friend and director. There's a story to tell, but there's a friendship at hand here. And many times the friendship won. And, you know, I wouldn't go down certain roads that I felt aren't necessary to tell this story. But, uh, yeah, the, the butting of heads was was just that. It was just creative. Do we really need to tell this or not? Well, it's funny because it's actually funny because we um, we would at times, like, disagree. But I was able to stand back and watch the film as an observer and take my emotional... Uh, you know, my, my emotional interest out of the equation. And like he said, he would show me, well, here's, here's what it looks like without this moment, and I'd watch it, and then here's what it looks like with this moment, and I'd be like, you know what, that way is better. So I was able to have a pretty open mind when it came to what we did and didn't use. And then there were other times when I just put my foot down, absolutely not, we're not doing this. And, and those, those moments were more creative in terms of, the way the the film was going to be framed or scored, rather than uh, volatile content. Absolutely, yeah. but more like no, we're not putting music that I made in this movie anywhere, right. Right. and that was a thing that both Todd at one point and our editor wanted. Uh, they were very strong about, and I was like, listen, if we put any Jane's Addiction or any of my solo material in this film, it's going to be too much. It's going to be suffocating because I don't want this to be, even though I'm the focus of it, I don't want it to become like a creative ego vanity narcissistic project. Yeah. You know what I mean? And like, here's my that's story like, and here's my film and, and that's here's some songs I made. By the soundtrack to Morning Sun. Right. And you know what I mean? Like, I couldn't that's have something that. That, I, that I saw on his end too. And I was like, okay, I see where your point is. It's not necessary. Mm -hmm. You know, I think we snuck one song in. You, you. Me what song? In oh, the weird one. one. Yeah, yeah, but which there's was one already married to the. Channel. But nobody knows that's that's me. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. what I like about that. <laughs> you had you said just a minute ago that sometimes you're riding a line between the director and friend, mm -hmm. and I think uh, a lot of the time in the limo as we cut back to that, we see you mainly in that scenario in that scene as the friend. Yeah. When how did you decide when it was time to be friend and when it was time to be director and when it was time to be friend, who did you get behind the camera to be the sort of de facto director just for the time that you're shooting there? Uh, I don't know if I ever entrusted anyone to be the de facto director in that sense, but I had friends who had, hey, hold the camera and keep it going and let me, you know, that that was that kind of thing. Uh, in, in the write-up, in the limo that you're talking about to San Quentin was... Uh, uh, our editor and a producer friend of ours that sat, you know, that was one of the reasons why we chose that kind of car to drive up in because they could sit across from us and shoot us, simply simply that. And uh, as far as riding that line or finding the middle ground of when I'm going to be director and when I'm going to be friend, it was usually just gut. It came to me naturally, like, now is not the time to be director, now is time to be friend. Um, yeah, in the car, if you're talking filmmaking-wise, there were specific things I wanted to hit to tell the story on the write-up, so I was thinking as a director, but yet, friend has to take over. It has to take precedence over that because think where we're going. <laughs> you know, think what we're driving to. Whether or not it's about making a cool thing in a film or something that's entertaining and interesting to the viewer, we're still going where we're going. You know, I have to be the friend there. He still tries to direct me. Yeah. That's so it's like one of the most... Like, hey, man. Yeah. <laughs> no. Potentially, like, one of the most profound moments of your life, and you're sitting there, and you've got a cameraman, and in many ways, you're playing... You're, you, are the, you are his friend, as he needs in that moment, but there's also the part of you that's the director who when, maybe when he's not looking, he's going, get a close-up. Yeah. Shoot the close-up. Did you ever notice that? We'll just Photoshop. I didn't some notice tears that, but, but I, I relied on him for that because at that moment I don't want anything to do with the filmmaking. I got my own, you know, I own. I got my own mountain to climb here, so I don't want to be aware of cameras. I don't want to be aware of shots. I don't want to be aware of cutaways and B-roll. I want him to be. That's why he's directing it. So I could have the experience of what I was dealing with. That was one of the things too. Is is I know just through our friendship that he trusts me enough to make the right decision 
in those moments. And he's not going to be hurt if in the middle of a moment between the two of you as friends, you have to direct something for a second. He knows that you're there as the director as well. You're close enough where he's not going to be like, come on, I thought we were friends. Right, right, right. And again, just like we started this conversation off with, because we had control of it, it was never something that was going to get out of hand or out of our hands if he didn't like the way it was going as far as directing or friendship. Yeah, at the end of the day, if I didn't like something, we're cutting it out. I mean, that's, yeah. you know, but <laughs> that's like, you know, there was, so if, knowing that, a guy could do whatever he wants. But speaking of getting out of hands, the when you visit uh, the man who, who, who killed your mother, that could have gotten out of hand to a certain degree. I mean, I not don't know physically, if, if, you're in yeah. a jail, but like emotionally, it could have gone somewhere that you may not have been expecting. Here's the thing about that that I think is really important, and, and I've recently talked to a number of people about that. Um, that was an experience that was not for him. It was for me. And so my headspace going into that was super, super important and dictated how that was going to go. Because, yes, it could have gotten really... Uh, aggressive and angry and emotional and and arguing and yelling and condemnations and it could have been all that and if I walked into that environment with that in my head I more than likely would have walked out of there with that in my head and be re-traumatized and re-triggered uh, as a result of it for me walking in there to see this guy sitting in an environment you know a lot of times as victims of crime we don't really get a chance to see very much uh, what happens to the perpetrators. You know, they go away to jail, and then you, you know, you wonder what's that like. What you know, what's the punishment? Is are they making friends? Are they having laughs? Are they you know, now he's a chess player and he's really enjoying his quiet time and getting used to. You know what I mean? Like old wise man in the you know cell what I mean? Kind getting thing, used yeah. to the, his environments. You know, it's kind of cozy in here. I got a TV. I got some friends, but so. To go and see the harsh reality of the punishment being carried out is was was really nice for me to see. I hate to say it was nice, but it was it was uh, important for me to see. And to walk out of the prison and leave him in the prison was empowering. And I think that since I didn't go with a head full of rage, I was able to allow it to be a positive experience because I know that if I went in there with a head full of rage, it, it would have been detrimental to me. Now, not going in there with a head full of rage, when you come out and you talk about the conversation that you had with this man, it's almost as if you allowed it to be somewhat casual. Yes. Was that weird for you in the moment? Could, could you see sort of outside of yourself maintaining this scenario? But no, like I mean, the truth is, like, and everybody asks me about that, and the truth is, like, I wish I could explain how simple it was mm -hmm. do you know what i mean and how it wasn't it wasn't extraordinary on any level it was just talking to some old guy dying in prison that i don't know very well he doesn't know me very well he's not going to make an apology i'm not expecting an apology i went in with you know realistic expectations which is this guy's a psychopath He's not going to admit guilt. He's not going to admit sorrow. So not having those expectations was really beneficial in terms of having that, that exchange. And that exchange was really mundane and not really that interesting and really not that exceptional. But the fact that it happened is what's important. The fact that I had it is what mattered. How did you guys feel as storytellers that you have this climactic moment of the movie that in many ways is knowingly anticlimactic. You know, as, as Dave just said, it's not, it was not extraordinary, and you are building up to this moment in many ways. What was extraordinary is what I took away. Yeah. That's what was extraordinary, and I'll let you answer that, but I don't want to say there wasn't anything extraordinary that happened. What I'm saying is what I took away from that is I just walked through a massive uh, example of fear in my life, uh, the personification of fear in my life, and the most horrible experience of my life and looked at it face to face and walked out of it, that opened the door to being free of so much negativity in my head that memories of uh, my good experiences with my family flooded back into my life. It was almost like a release valve. So I will say that- That's you know, pretty extraordinary. 
Exactly, and that's what we go on to tell. So it wasn't like I had this really heated exchange, and he said this, and then I said that, and then, you know what I mean? It, that didn't matter. What mattered is, and I think the message I'm trying to convey is that my headspace going into it dictated my headspace coming out of there, which was open enough to have, I'm getting chills thinking about it, <laughs> open enough to have those experiences. Go ahead. Yeah, that that's exactly the way I went into the direction of it, too, is, is the only moment I'm trying to go here for, as far as a storyteller, as you say, is to take the ride and just go up there. There was no expectations on me. First of all, I knew we weren't going to have the opportunity to get this on film anyway, just because of of uh, policy with the, the prison itself. And, and believe me, I tried. <laughs> but that wasn't the goal. The goal was for him to go and face a fear. It wasn't about to try and rip an apology out of this man or any of that. I knew that going into it as well. So for me, the um, it wasn't anticlimactic. The fact that we were just doing it was climactic for me as a director and as his friend that, you know, because even granted, again, to talk, talk about something that we talked about earlier, there was a moment where even I think I've expo uh, expressed to him that I said, you know, if we get up there and you don't want to go in, we don't go in. And that's part of the storytelling. That's what happened. We just decided to go up here and it wasn't worth it. So we didn't go in. So I had no expectations whatsoever on it being the, it's going to be yelling and screaming and climax, you know, a climax in that in that sense. Did you have any thought or any idea as to where it might land in the film afterwards? Or were you just kind of, this is something that he's going to do. Let's shoot it and see what comes out of it. Because even when it's over and he comes into the, and Dave comes into mm -hmm. back into the car, he doesn't talk for an extended period of time. And mm -hmm. it might be one of those scenarios where like, like I said, maybe he just doesn't want to talk about it. Right. That part, that part of the movie and you had been thinking that it could be the end, is not going to be in the movie. Yeah, now. and that was excruciating to have him not talk. I mean, you see it for a couple of seconds in the film that he's unable to talk. It was a while. That's a six-hour ride back down to, to L.A. From, from San Francisco, you know? So, yeah, it was. And, and what's swirling through my head is nothing about the filmmaking part of it after that. It's completely like, it was, did, was this detrimental? Did I just damage him by, you know, I'm taking it on my own shoulders. I shouldn't have let him do this. I should have protected him, you know? And it ended up being the experience that he had, which was, uh, you know, wonderful in that sense. Let me chime in about the anticlimactic nature of not being able to film the inmate. And something we've talked about since, and I think is a... I am, I am an avid fan of crime documentary, of true crime, of investigation discovery, of all those shows, 48 hours, Dateline, like, I, I, I'm a fanatic about yeah, I gobble them up, too. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I love it. And generally speaking, in those stories, and the way those stories are told, the focus of those stories is the perpetrator, is the criminal, is the killer. I didn't want to tell that story. I don't want to make this guy the component that we're... T I don't want him to make him the star. I don't want him to make him a folk hero. I want to focus on what this does to the family. If you want to learn about fascinating serial killers, be my guest, I'll be there with you. I was up all night watching Leopold and Loeb uh, last night. So I understand that fascination, but that's not the story I wanted to tell. So the fact that we can't shoot this guy really is helpful in keeping it my story and keeping it a story about overcoming trauma because I don't want to open the door of making this guy some kind of fascinating mystique you know, driven character. And the film the definitely film. doesn't do that. Yeah, the psychology of the criminal was not our intention at all to get into that background on the guy or anything. So, And I'll just say, when I use the word anticlimactic, I didn't mean shooting inside the prison and, and, and getting, like, the full interview with them. I mean... Oh, no, the filmmaker me the wished car. that we had that footage, too. You know what I mean? Like, you have no... Idea. Like, yeah, I wanted that. that but even when you get back into the car, you don't get into the car, and you're, and you're not like, I saw a car, I punched him in... You know, you, set, you get back into the car, and you're just like... Well, I mean, talk to a guy. it really was real. I mean, it was real. I don't there was, and we had ways we wanted it to go and ways we thought it could go, but we didn't have any absolutes. And getting back in the car and what you see and, and that moment is just, that was what happened. You know, it's it, as real as it gets. Probably, probably the most real moment I have ever publicly shown. Can I ask you a question? When you went in to have that moment, when you had this experience, 
Was there a part of you, did you know which part of you was doing it for the sake of the film and which part of it was doing it for you? Or are those two things just completely intertwined? Um, it's interesting. That's a really smart question. And, uh, you know, <laughs> finally. <laughs> uh, it only took 22 <laughs> minutes. <laughs> um, uh, you know, there were moments when I don't think if we were making this film and we weren't as deep into it, I don't know if I would have done it. I probably wouldn't have done it. And I knew that I needed this this moment for the film. And so it's one of those things, like, it doesn't matter why you did the awesome thing that helped you out as long as you did it. So it's that kind of thinking. Like, I was, you know, kind of like, all right, I'm going to go do this because now we've, we're here and might as well deal with it because I don't have a film without it. And I've been working on this thing for five years, six years. Um, so I went ahead anyway as the filmmaker, and I walked out of it as the survivor. Absolutely. I'm curious. Uh, I'm going to backtrack pretty far right now. Nice. How did the two of you? How did the two Good of work. you meet? Um, through uh, mutual friends and through you know recovery. I share a lot of the same experiences and background as you saw with him on film. Uh, which is another thing to say about earlier, like, I didn't have this happen to me, and that ended up happening to me. Do you know what I mean? So it doesn't... doesn't way to go, bro. Um, addiction, addiction can kind of come from... Yeah, 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 yeah. But we've known each other for years, and through mutual friends, and through that world as well, and there's been times he's helped me out, and I've helped him out, and, you know, this, this friendship has just gone on. As you see in the film, there's a section that we call, we dubbed the humor section to kind of explain the type of people that we are in a, as a coping mechanism as well. And we, uh, we forged our, our friendship on that basis of having that same kind of sense of humor. And you said that this film took five or six years to make. Was there ever a time when you guys didn't think that you were going to finish it? I don't know. There was never a time for me that I didn't think we would finish it. There was a time for me where I thought we would... We wouldn't. Um, we would shelf it, um, yeah. just for whatever reason, emotional things. You know, whether it had to do with the film or not, or just life in general. But yeah, it was. But I don't think we. I ever thought that we wouldn't finish it. I, I don't think so either. I mean, the, the the it took a long time because documentary filmmaking takes a long time for starters, which is something we learned. Yeah. About three years into it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, this really takes I had a long to like time. hire a private investigator to find people that had to do with the case and uh, and some people had passed away that were involved because I you know, we went down the road of tracking down FBI agents and policemen and, and friends and family and neighbors. So I had I had that and then, you know, in a documentary film you interview one person and they disclose something that you never heard, and you have to go follow that whole thing and is it you have to follow it to the end because is it worth it to tell in this story? You know, at one point, I had like a seven-hour film in the timeline, <laughs> and how am I going to get this to a, you know, a palpable where the where the viewer can really um, ingest this? And so that, you know, there were there's parts of the story that I couldn't tell. Yeah, and there was also, I mean, while we were making the film, I'm I'm going on tour for months at a time. I'm shooting the TV show in New York City for months at a time. So there was, you know, I, I, you could add up a couple of years. I just literally wasn't available. Yeah, and you have this TV show, Ink Master, that you've been doing for a number of years now. When you put a movie like this out, does it affect the show at all, or do you just no, kind of... not at all. Not at all? I don't think so. Do you love doing the show? I love it. I absolutely love it. Because for me, I get to be around... Obviously, I'm a huge fan of tattooing, and uh, I'm no way. very inspired by by artistry, and so I get to be in a room full of really talented artists every day for work that has nothing to do with my work. So this is all us, this is all me. When I go to Ink Master, it's all them. And it's fun to just be a fan in a room like that with really talented people. Absolutely, I'm gonna turn it over to the audience for questions. Does anybody have any questions out here in the audience? Hey, Dave and Todd, thank you so much for being here and having the, bur the bravery for putting a film like this out. Thank you. Also losing a parent a couple of years back in an unnatural way, I could understand the pain on some level. Mm -hmm. How would you both encourage people to share their story and come out and uh, instead of internalize their experience? Because I think internalizing things isn't always the healthiest way to go about their business and uh, the only way to move on is to share. That is 
an incredibly great question, and I appreciate the question. Thank you very much. What you're talking about is surviving trauma, basically, whether it's through a violent crime, whether it's through something, like you said, an unexpected death or a, a medical situation or cancer, whatever it is. Even, you know, even a kid's dog getting run over by a car. Loss is loss. Trauma is traumatic. And one of the ways to get through that and, to, and help ourselves get through that is to find a way to make a linear narrative of the, of the story so it's not rattling around in your head at its own will. And one of the things I found through the, per, the process of making this film is that I put everything in a linear timeline, it was my story, the way I wanted to tell it, and it really, I, I don't want to say it made sense of it, but it made it much more, uh, much easier to digest and keep in a right-sized framework. And what happens when you don't do that? What happens when you don't uh, have an understanding on a linear level of your story and what it is and, and you lose control of it? What happens is trauma gets re-triggered over and over and over again because it lives in us physically. It lives in us, in our brain, in our chemistry, in our physiology. So when something new happens, say a, a car horn out on the street, it can bring up that trauma that lives inside you and you can experience it all over again, over and over and over again. So sharing about it, talking about it, helping others, being of service to others is a huge one for me. Um, and that's one of the reasons why we put this out because as a result, we work with Safe Horizon, we work with nomore.org, these are you know, different organizations that assist people in domestically violent situations. And, and doing stuff like that has been a really helpful tool for me. And, and then the obvious strokes, therapy, sharing with a friend, not locking up your secrets inside, thinking that you're alone, that you're the only one who's going through this and no one's gonna understand, having expectations on yourself as to how you're supposed to deal with something, but really allowing it to breathe and live and as a, pro as a result of that, letting it go. I don't know if that makes sense. That made perfect sense. That was a great answer. Um, Todd, I think you were joking about Photoshopping um, your, 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 your ear back on, but that was a, such an incredible trailer. The shots of the highway, the shots of the mom. Was a lot of the time spent making this after you filmed with all like the computer-generated effects and such? You mean in the in the specifically to the trailer? The whole movie must have a lot of really nice. Yeah, I mean we ha I hired a, a, a graphic uh, effects guy to make some of the you know some of the stuff. There was such a wealth because of what Dave's mom did for a living. Uh, she was a model and an actress, and there was a great. We were lucky enough to find a treasure trove of old modeling pictures and some footage, a commercial reel in particular. So, you know. Uh, taking those and accentuating them artistically to make the film, yeah, it was important to me. So we hired a, a graphic artist where I would send off the shots and say, can we make the water ripple in the background? Can we move this way? Can we lose that background out of that thing? And that was very towards the end, once the story was all in place, that was, okay, this shot is staying here, and I wanted to have a little more artistic uh, integrity uh, to really bring out her beauty and stuff like that, so yeah. If you don't mind, I'd like to go back to one thing uh, about the last question. Dave, you had mentioned domestic violence, and I think we talked a lot about the filmmaking process, and we talked a lot about your personal experience, but we haven't talked that much about the work that you've done with uh, domestic violence uh, uh, survivors and, and, and everything. And domestic violence is a huge part of our culture. The majority, I think, of, of, of gun victims in a lot of times are victims that are, are, are women who are the hands of former lovers or ex-boyfriends. Can you talk a little bit about when you started working uh, with groups? It really wasn't until we got into making this film that I even realized that this was domestic violence. I had heard of domestic violence. I knew a lot about it. I, you know, Obviously, in this culture, we can't, sadly, we can't avoid hearing about it. You have this sort of image of domestic violence as like the couple fighting in another room and like a little kid doesn't want to hear it or something right. like that, and not I, like this. In my head, I'm like, well, this, this, was, this was something else. This was murder. This is my life. I, this is my story. You know, we get protective of our, of our own experiences. And then I realized while we were making this, I was like, wow, this is, this is what we're talking about. And I think, if anything, that gave me the, uh, 
that re-motivated us at one point. Yeah, to absolutely. Tell this story in a way. And like I just at the way this film ends, you know, we talk a little bit about, you know, different organizations that I work with, No More and uh, Linda's, Linda's Voice. Voice. Um, which are great organizations. There's a multitude of them, and if anybody's watching this, please look into these places. Um, but I didn't want this to become... I didn't want to paint it with that self-help brush at the end of it, like gloss over everything's fine now, and you know what I mean? And, but I wanted to make sure that those beats were hit, so we put that in there, and you know, it's a, it's a short little segment. But... Um, I have found that relatability and, and being a part of these organizations and helping others has, as I talked to this gentleman about, has really helped me in terms of finding some peace. Absolutely. Next question. Uh, thanks, guys, for being here and making this incredibly important film. Also, uh, Dave, with your work with Safe Horizons No More, like you were saying, also very important. Um, so kind of in answering your that first question about timelines, you, uh, you mentioned... You're talking about how to deal with it afterwards, um, after the fact. Yeah. Is this uh, documentary, I know I read somewhere that you said this kind of changed your relationship with your mother. Yeah. Um, is this cathartic experience, can it be like shelved now or is this an, an evolving relationship and could you, what could you say to people, uh, victims of domestic violence who are trying to deal with it? Um, how can they continue down the road to uh, deal with these things? I, I think that, uh, again, really great insightful questions. You guys got, this, these people are, you know what they're doing here. Um, well, I don't think there's ever going to be a day where it's like, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm all healed and it's all great and everything, you know, like I say that in the film. Um, but certainly for me, like, yeah, I, you know, I've created music through the pain of this event and I've metaphorically worked on stuff through this event and now I've literally done it with a documentary film. It's about as literal as you can get. So you got music, which is really artistic and open to interpretation. You got film, which is specifically what you're seeing is what is being said, is, what, is what's meant. Um, so in that sense, I think that I'm probably done with any, like, yeah, there's gonna be no future films. Any film that we do from now on is going to be scripted with a specific amount of shoot days and a beginning, middle, and end, and actors, and you're done and out of here. We're gonna do that. But um, yeah, I think I'm done being creative about this, and I'm just, you know, I'm happy to move forward. Um, and as far as the domestic violence people, what I would say to them is, is what we've been talking about, really, which is, um, if, if it's someone who's in a, a dangerous situation to reach out to these organizations, nomore.org, Safe Horizon, Linda's Voice, people of that nature. And for people who've already been in those toxic environments and they're struggling with the aftermath, you know, like we've been talking about it, you know, therapy is a valuable, valuable tool. Um, there's a multitude of different types of recovery out there that aren't just therapy. There's 12-step groups, there's meditation, there's whatever their spiritual or religious beliefs are to you know, turn to those things. Um, whatever works for the individual. But the one thing that I would say is a no-no, which is suck it up and deal with it. Do not do that, because that's going to drive you deeper into the hole, 100%. Guys, congratulations on the yeah. movie. Thank you so much for being here. The movie is uh, it's on iTunes now, right? How can people yeah. see it? Yep. Uh, it's on iTunes, uh, Amazon. Amazon Instant, Google Play, yeah. many of the VOD uh, sites. And, and Absolutely. Channels. And when does Ink Master come back? Well, it's on now. It's on now? Yeah. So, All right. And then I don't know when it comes back, but uh, we are, yeah, we're in the middle of season seven. Awesome. Ink so Master it's actually on tonight. Guys, check out Ink Master tonight and Morning Sun on VOD. Thank you so much, you guys, for being here. Thank you. Thank you so much, guys.